So I called my contribution Alice in Wonderland, getting curiouser and curiouser. And that relates to my position as a clinician, as a roughing instructor, having started to visit the science land. And on that journey, you discover very curious things. So as you all know, in the field of manual therapy, the field is very strongly dominated by the existence of different schools. And these schools are usually oriented around charismatic founders. For example, in my school around Ida P. Rolf, the osteopaths around Andrew Taylor Still. And these founders had their very profound clinical experiences and they try to explain them based on the knowledge at their time as best as they could. For example, in our school, we have been teaching for several decades that with the roughing strokes, we are uh, changing a gel to salt transition in the ground substance, or that we are also loosening cross links between the collagen fibers. But if you meet us teachers late night at the bar, we don't know a shit about it, and we agree to that. <laughs> So that situation has started to shift 2007 with the first uh, Fascia Research Congress at Harvard Medical School. And I think the two-page article in Science Magazine has been uh, describing that very well, the challenge, but also the difficulties and the excitement about these very different groups uh, uh, trying to exchange. Uh, that slide was shown in Amsterdam also. So you have the two groups, so maybe the clinicians naked on the left and the scientists a little more dressed on the right side, reaching out to each other, but, tr but trying to speak a similar language. But there is a, a big expectation that this exchange can be fruitful for, for both sides. So you see me on the left as a young hippie 30 years ago, as a young missionary rofer uh, on my search for enlightenment in India. And I'm one of the people, and I'm not alone at all, that we have started to, to walk uh, in the bridge so trying to walk uh, from the science land, you know, from the complementary me medicine land towards the science land. Other people have been walking the bridge in the opposite direction. Tom Findlay, he started out as a medical MD, PhD, scientist, researcher, and then he spent several years uh, training himself as a, as a, as a, as a rolfer. Jaap van der Waal, who was a very prominent presenter at the last Congress, he has been doing laboratory histological research and just last year or this year he is leaving the academic world to focus mostly as a complementary therapist and teacher so within that world. So we are meeting halfway through and we are exchanging experiences uh, there. So, I, I, so I'm reporting to you as somebody who has started to walk like Alice in Wonderland into the science land and coming back and telling my, my own folks what strange people these scientists are. <laughs> So, so this is Alan's, uh, Alice here, and, and you see these scientists, that they are very strange figures. But after a while, you notice to make distinctions between them. So what have I learned from my own practice? Uh, I still maintain a regular hands-on roughing practice, and I think I have profited, I believe so, from these frequent visits uh, into science land. So I'll give you three examples of, of how I have profited and, and how I think uh, you guys and, and that both sides can profit from the exchange. The first one are the fluid dynamics. So when I now put my elbow on somebody's lumbar fascia or I rough somebody on the uh, non-existent nuclear ligament on the, on the, on, 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 on the neck, then uh, I pay attention to the fluid dynamics in it rather than to collagen crosslinks or to the mechanoreceptors that may be in there. And that is from a very new article that you have in your delegate bags in the new issue of Journal of Body Work and Movement Therapy that took us three years to publish finally, in which we measured the water content 
in facial tissues before they are being stretched and then immediately after a stretch. And we showed that you, that at least within that stretch uh, application that we did, that you significantly decrease the water content. And then after the manipulation, water is coming back into the tissue. The question is, what kind of water? And listening to Gerald Pollack yesterday, I want to know whether it's bulk water and, and, or, or, or bound water and, and the different properties of it. I think probably the water molecules that are coming back into the same tissues are not exactly the same ones as they have been there. So I think it's partly a, a, a rejuvenation of the tissues. And we also showed that the stiffness of the tissue is uh, changing, that, that, that these water content changes are associated with significant changes in how, how soft and how, stiffness and how stiff the, the tissue is getting. And that uh, goes very well with the presentation that we had yesterday from Reed, and that you also have in the Congress book in the nice article from Melody Schwartz, in which she showed, and I find that from this year's conference, one of the most profound stimulations for me. And thank you to Tom Findlay for pointing that out before in our internal discussions, that the fluid dynamics May, so, so we have overlooked them in the past years, in the past congresses. And in, in the work that Reed was referring, that Melody Schwartz is uh, reporting in these articles, she describes how subtle changes in fluid shear through the cell cultures have a profound effect on, on the cells. So if you put fibroblasts in a cell dish, they respond to chemical changes, to changes in pH, they change to mechanical stimulation, we knew all that, but they are very sensitive to slow gradients, how fast and how slow you push fluid around them. So it may be even, there are new speculations, that the whole mechanostimulation, or to a large part, is mostly that you squeeze, that you move water around the cells, and that that may be speaking their primary language as some little ocean creatures. So that has profoundly influenced my work. So when I'm now working, I, I work slower and my work has even become more gentle. I'm not trying to untangle uh, uh, collagen crosslinks only anymore or to stimulate Golgi receptors. I think about altering so the speed matters and where you get them at which pocket of the tissue. I think it's a beautiful model and it makes the whole work very, very exciting for me. So that is one aspect. Uh, in this aspect, I want to make some advertisement for the new Myoton tool that you have a chance, maybe uh, uh, outside later, that we have been experimenting at Ulm University where you can measure tissue stiffness, not with the ultrasound uh, machine that we had heard, heard this morning, but it is like a digital finger that comes out into the tissue. I don't know if the camera is showing that. So you have a digital finger here, you put it onto the tissue, and then it makes 10 little indentations. And it measures very exactly the, the stiffness of the tissue. The question is what kind of tissue? Uh, are you measuring the fascia? Are you measuring the subcutaneous fat tissue? Are you, are you measuring the muscles? But my finger has the same difficulties. And the advantage is if, for example, the stiffness three days after my treatment is 8% decreased, I don't have such an exact memory. I would feel it if the client comes again, if it's 50% degrees. But if there are three hours or three days in between, I, 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 I doubt that I would notice it. But this instrument will notice it. And 8% of, of a difference can be very, very profound. So I find that tool uh, very handy. It needs to be continued, but that is something that I can imagine to use on a regular basis within my, client, uh, so with, so within my clinical practice. Uh, th this is uh, the new article that's also in the, in the uh, Congress book from uh, Siegfried Menzies' lab and the article from Tessarts. And I think that's a groundbreaking news for me in which they quantified the density of sensory nerves uh, in different layers of the fascia. So that is the muscle, that is the lumbar fascia of rat and humans. So, so they did it in both the quantification. And here you have the subcutaneous fat tissue. 
And I would have expected the highest density of proprioceptive, but also of nociceptive nerve endings within the dense layer of the lumbar fascia where you really have the strain application. But here you see the percentage. The dense layer has almost nothing. Actually, in terms of nociceptive nerve endings, zero, no nerve endings in it. Most of them, or even all of them, if you look at the nociceptive or CGRP-containing nerve endings, they are within the transitional zone or within the loose connective tissue that you see there. And that is a sur surprise for me. So it may be that most of the proprioception that you want to foster in your clients, but maybe also most of the myofascial pain, may come from much more superficial areas than I have been aware of. So when you skin a rat like we are doing here, you have several layers of loose connective tissue that is transparent following with the dermis to the right, but one layer stays always to the left. And, there, and we call that the superficial shearing zone. And I've been teaching for 20 years my students that when you move the skin here, you are testing for the movement between loose connective tissue and fascia profunda. Now that doesn't seem to be right. Nature does it more simple. When it wants easy sliding, it has two slippery layers relating to each other rather than a slippery layer in relationship to a rough and dense layer. So this is an interesting zone between two slippery layers uh, on the transition between the fascia profunda and the superficial fascia, that where, where probably a lot of the proprioception is happening, but also where a lot of adhesions are developing. And that has actually led my attention now to work more superficial. I have taught my, client, my students for many years, if you work deeper, you are more profound. Now I think if you work more superficial, you may be more effective in terms of stimulating proprioceptive nerve endings and in terms of reaching the potential nociceptors in there. So when you do this Keebler test that many of you have learned 20 years ago, you are probably testing for adhesion within that superficial shearing zone. What can the scientists take from that uh, exchange? This is one observation from Vladimir Yanda. He observed a close relationship between strong sympathetic activation and fascial tonicity. And a recent publication just came out in which they showed that strong sympathetic activation leads to an increase of TGF beta 1, which then alters the immune system. That has been known, but we know that TGF beta 1 also is the most known, strongest, potent activator of myofibroblasts to cause fibrosis, but also to lead to fascial stiffening. So that would be a very nice line of research to look at the relationship between long-term sympathetic stress activation, we clinicians know that, and fascial tonicity and fibrosis. Last one for the scientists. Uh, this is what your scientists have discovered, that what, what's been published from Boris Hint's lab, Fibroblasts put together in a cell dish, as close packed as you are sitting here, they tend to oscillate together in a very slow rhythm of about 100 seconds for one contraction and one relaxation. For clinicians, a rhythm of 100 seconds is reminiscent of the so-called long tide in biodynamic craniosacral therapy. So that would be a very nice experiment so that I invite you, anybody, a master student to come to Ulm University. You need about 500 hours free up your sleeve to test whether in a less close packed situation, when you have a real fascial tissue, whether they also contract in a 100 second rhythm. I think it's possible, but I don't, so, so, so it could be also a total palpatory illusion. And finally, Basically, it's something that the scientists can learn from us clinicians is if you want to understand connective tissue, it works well to adapt some of the properties of the connecting tissue within your own social structure. So in the scientist world, competition is a big thing. You hide your information. It's all about who publishes first. So the, the beauty of the field that we have been creating here is the beauty of exchange of, uh, of information. So you see people in the hallway exchanging USB sticks with their slides, uh, forming a little collaboration. So that's something that's very familiar to the complementary therapists. And my invitation to the scientists is, is to incorporate some of that strengths, some of the networking 
in your efforts, in your collaboration efforts, in order to understand the organ of networking. Thank you very much.